Okay, so these last two trends, electron affinity and metallic character, are the least uh, the least trendy of the trends. They have a lot of problems, but we'll go ahead and talk about them. Your book talks about them. You're expected to know the general trends, uh, but there's so many exceptions in some of this stuff. So let's talk about electron affinity. Electron affinity is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Uh, electron affinity is the energy that's released when an atom absorbs an electron. So if I have an atom and then I add an electron to it, I'm going to get an anion. So that's going to fuse that electron into its structure, so it'll become an anion. This would be the first electron affinity, but if for we're not talking about we're going to talk about second electron affinities because none of those turn out to be um, endothermic or exothermic uh, but the first electron affinity is the absorbing of an electron and the releasing of energy so this is an exothermic process generally um, and the more negative this number right the larger the electron affinity is and so what would you expect to see as a trend. Well, on a periodic table, right? This is my very crude periodic table. Uh, you might expect it to be highest here. And the reason you'd expect it to be highest there is the atom's effective nuclear charge is highest. It's got a smaller radius, so when it brings the electron in, it moves it closer to the nucleus, and more energy can be released in that process. So that totally makes sense going left to right. And then going from bottom to top, that also kind of makes sense that it would be highest at the top. The reason it's highest at the top okay, is because the atoms are smaller and the electron moves closer to the nucleus and more energy can be released. Again, it's that Coulomb's law, one over that the energy... I'm going to really generalize here. It's proportional to 1 over R. That is, as it gets closer, the energy gets larger. It's a negative value just because it's an exothermic uh, um, process. Now, in general, then, we expect largest up here. And it's kind of following, you know, radius trends or ionization energy trends. And it's all for the same reasons. Now, let's actually look at the numbers because they're not very good. Um, in general, right, if we're looking at big in generals, that one's big. That one's small. But it's not the smallest, right? Because it turns out, like, group 2A, electron affinities are very small or greater than zero. What does greater than zero mean? It means you actually have to force the electron onto the atom. And then what you see is... Yeah, boron is minus 27, fluorine is minus 328, but it goes smaller, larger, smaller, larger, largest, like that. And the noble gases basically don't take electrons. So that's actually a clue as to why these effects are happening. If you're thinking about lithium picking up an electron, this is what we're looking at. Lithium plus an electron makes... L I minus right plus 60 kilojoule 60 kilojoules of energy per mole. That's what this number is. It's energy in kilojoules per mole. This is an exothermic process because the energy is being released. In terms of electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s1, and then I add an electron, so it becomes 1s2, 2s2, and so it's filled. It's okay with that. It releases the electron as the electron uh, energy as the electron drops in. But what happens to beryllium? Well, beryllium, the process would be analogous. I'd pick up an electron and make Be minus, and then this is greater than zero, so it's not really endothermic. So the question is, why is that? Well, beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. So it's already filled. Be minus would be 1s2, 2s2, and then 2p1. And so I've got to put that electron into that higher energy level. It doesn't actually want the electron. 
is the way I like to say it anyways. It doesn't want the electron. It's like I have company coming over and I'm going to have to move them into a room in my house. And my house, uh, I've never been here, but I don't think any of you have. If you've ever been here, you know the rooms are all full of stuff because I have six kids, right? So I would have to like move all that stuff. It takes a lot of energy to clear a room out to put somebody into it. So... That's why you see a, an anomaly. It's not really an anomaly. It's an explains like deviation for what we were hoping would happen. Uh, we see an anomaly in group 2A all the way down. Now, we generally see increases from left to right and the P, uh, P uh, group, right, P block. Uh, but again, between nitrogen and oxygen, if I look at nitrogen versus oxygen, nitrogen's orbital diagram, the easiest way to do it, is this is 2P, uh, 2S and 2P. I'm just going to show its valence shell. Well, nitrogen would be the half-filled guy. It's like this. And then oxygen, all right, this is 2S and this is 2P. Oxygen, you have to start pairing them up. So like, you know, it's not very neat. When I'm sticking this electron in here, there's some electron-electron repulsion, and as a result, it's kind of harder to get that electron uh, to go into nitrogen. Okay, so because remember what happens with nitrogen, it goes in from 2p, like 3, so it goes from 2s2, 2p3, and then when you add an electron to it, it becomes 2s2, 2p4. Right, this is nitrogen and then n minus which would be the same as oxygen and so because you have to pair the electrons it doesn't want to do that and then the obvious question comes up i think it's kind of obvious why is oxygen negative then when it has to pair it right oxygen gives off energy when it pairs the electron because it picked up a proton it has more charge in its nucleus to accommodate the negative charge that you just added to it from the electron so this is kind of the trend. It's not very good, right? Uh, try to, it's uh, sort of like the make-believe version. Let's just believe that this is true. It increases from left to right, or this is the make-believe version down here, increases from left to right and bottom to top, okay? And then if you're asked questions about why there are deviations in the uh, electron affinities from nitrogen to oxygen, it's really just because you're going from half-filled to one over half-filled when you're adding the electrons to nitrogen. And then oxygen accepts the electron freely simply because it has more effective nuclear charge. Uh, you could do the same thing, uh, discussions for beryllium and boron and uh, lithium and why they follow the trend that they follow. Okay, so um, last trend has to do with metals and non-metals. And just a quick review, right? Metals are malleable and ductile. So malleable means you can make a thin foil out of it. Ductile just means you can stretch it into a wire. Um, I think you know what shiny or lustrous means. They reflect light, they have that shiny appearance. They conduct electricity and heat very well. Um, most oxides are basic and ionic and form cations in solution, lose electrons in reactions. Uh, they are generally oxidized. Okay, so the properties of metal, metals in general. Uh, Non-metals are brittle and in their solid states. Um, they're dull and non-reflective. Many of them are gases. Many of the metals, uh, non-metals are gases in their natural state. Uh, they're not very good at conducting electricity or heat. And most oxides are acidic and are of a molecular nature rather than an ionic nature. We talked about ionic compounds and covalent compounds, and we did nomenclature. Acids are mostly molecular compounds. Uh, they form anions and polyatomic anions, and they generally tend to gain electrons uh, and are reduced in chemical reactions. And so these are what we mean by properties of metals and nonmetals. Now, if you try to lump all this together and you say, where are things most metallic and where are things least metallic, I think really all you have to do is, again, look at the periodic. So here's my periodic table. I keep referring back to the same one. Um, sorry about that. I maybe should be inserting periodic tables over and over and over again. Uh, but... Where are the metals and where are the non-metals? Well, you know, we've been doing this for a while, so I would expect that you would say something to the effect that, oh yeah, these 
Those are the non-metals, and everything else is metals. So the least metallic character is in the top right, and the most metallic character turns out to be in the bottom left. So the most metallic elements, in principle, are these ones down here. But, you know, there's a lot of wiggle in that room. So it's not the best thing to be saying it that way. But that's what you're expected to know. There are, For example, conductivity. Conductivity varies by number of uh, free and um, paired electrons and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff that's in the transition elements that doesn't follow that trend. Hardness um, also doesn't follow that trend. So how hard a metal is, it doesn't follow this trend that we're talking about now. But in general, most metallic characters in the bottom left and least metallic characters in the top right. So there you go. Um, other than that, that's kind of it for the trends. Uh, one of the things that people will say in general is the more weakly, uh, more weakly electrons are held, the more metallic the element will be. So it kind of follows the ionization trends. The lowest ionization energies are in the bottom left, and the highest ionization energies are in the top right. Metallic character decreases from left to right because you're going towards the non-metals, right? And it goes increases as you go down, and you can kind of get that again from the periodic table. This is a non-metal, this is a metal, right? So you're going increasing metallic character going down this way and across this way. Oh, many years ago I stole this image from uh, a book. Gosh, this is from like 1990 something maybe 1996, actually, even before I started teaching. Um, there's more metallic character, more el negative electron affinity, increasing ionization energy, and then I ionization and, sorry, atomic radius and metallic character increase to this corner, and up in this corner, we have all of these things increasing. So hopefully that's a useful summary table. You can use that for solving, like, uh, of the following pair of elements, like which is the most metallic and which is the most, uh, has the highest ionization energy and that kind of stuff.